Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom and pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. Andy Husbands is the award-winning chef, author, and pitmaster behind the Smoke Shop Barbecue, Boston's acclaimed barbecue restaurant with five locations and a three-time winner of, of Boston Magazine's Best Barbecue. He is the author of six cookbooks, most notably Pitmaster, Recipes, Techniques, and Barbecue Wisdom. With a career spanning nearly 30 years in the restaurant industry, Husband serves as one of Boston's most celebrated culinary leaders and a foremost authority on regional barbecue and live fire cooking in New England. Hey, Andy, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm great. How are you? My pleasure to be here. Yeah, great. Hey, great to have you here. Hey, uh, um, tell me how you got started in the restaurant industry. <laughs> so in the um, you know early 80s, uh, I needed a job, and I got a job in a uh, bakery called Hazel's Bakery, still around in Needham, Massachusetts, on Great Plain Avenue. And um, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I worked for this baker. He was crazy. He would be there at 4 in the morning, uh, yelling and screaming. I was kind of assisting, but I just loved every minute of it. Um, I don't know. You know, I love the intensity. I love making things. I love making things by hand, hands, and it just found it exciting. And from there, you know, even high school working in restaurants, and uh, I knew that's would, how my journey would go. It just felt right to me. Funny thing, though, my father said, uh, when I told him I wanted to go to Johnson & Wales, he's like, no son of mine is going to be a fry cook. And, you know, got to remember, this is before Food Network. I mean, Julia Child, Yank and Cook, uh, Frugal Gourmet, those guys were kind of around, but not necessarily, you know, uh, chef owned restaurants wasn't really a thing though at the time I mean blue uh, sorry olives was open East Coast Grill these are Boston restaurants were all open but they were just beginning it was like this new wave and I just I don't know I wanted to do it my father was not into it but um, you know I, I convinced him and here I am today yes. still doing it yeah you definitely are so uh, did you have any inclination that when you were working in that bakery that you would be kind of that you would kind of morph into a into a barbecue wizard <laughs> no and i'll tell you a funny thing is i worked uh, at uh, after college i worked for uh james beard award-winning chef chris lessinger he's my mentor and the biggest brawl i ever got to him and i would push i was like very cocky and you know i was challenging my mentor and that's kind of what you do as a mentee and i was pushing him and he really wanted me to work uh at his barbecue restaurant and I didn't want to have nothing to do with it. Nothing. I was so mad at him. And I'm like, I don't understand why I have to work here. I want to work in your other restaurant. I want to be a fancy chef. Um, he almost fired me. It was just a serious, serious argument. Um, and and to this day, he will never let me live it down. That that's what I do now is run barbecue restaurants. So, um, so how did you kind of get interested in barbecue? <clears throat> well, as I said, I worked for Chris last journey. Forced me to work at his barbecue place. But... To be honest, I, I was 22 now at this point. I had never had real barbecue. And real barbecue, man, coming out of the pit, it's just amazing. I never really had anything like that. I grew up in Seattle. I didn't know. You know, and this is like in the 80s. Barbecue wasn't, there's no Instagram, you know? So um, I, 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 I just, uh, so I liked it. And my buddy was working there. And then me and my buddy opened a restaurant. It was like a fancy restaurant, which I owned for like 20 years before I, I'm on this path now. and. Um, I opened this restaurant with my buddy. We we bu I bought him out after a year. It wasn't what he wanted to do. And we didn't talk for a while. And we there was this barbecue competition coming up. And we just said, why don't why don't we why don't we do that? It's kind of like we wanted to get back together and there was a reason to go be together. It was do this barbecue competition. We thought we'd come in and kill it. You know, professional chef. We know what we're doing. 
we got murdered, but had the best weekend ever. Lots of bourbon, lots of cussing, lots of laughing, lots of competing, lots of losing. We didn't care. We had the best weekend. And we're like, we want to do this. We want to compete. I'm not going to give you the full story because it's a beautiful, wonderful story, but it takes forever. Um, Fast forward 15 years, uh, we became the first non-Southern team to win the World Championships of Barbecue in Lynchburg, Tennessee. Um, so, you know, like any sport, a lot of practice and a little bit of shenanigans. Is it more nerve-wracking or exhilarating to participate in those cooking competitions? Oh, it's exhilarating. I love it. I love it. I, I love it. And um, yeah, I guess I should answer fully answer your other question, which was how did I kind of how did I get here, which is owning restaurants. I had my other restaurant, which was fancy, you know, change your uh, menu every two week kind of restaurant, um, farm to table stuff. And I was like, I had done it for, I don't know, at the time, 17 years. I was ready for something new. I didn't know what it was, but I was ready to do something new. And I, I, I have a friend and uh, this other guy, uh, Brian Lesser, and I, we partnered. We decided, like, let's do something and let's do something multi-unit. That was it. Let's just do something. And we were going to do an izakaya, a Japanese pub, a raucous Japanese pub, which I love. I love izakayas. The question is, is what do I know about cooking izakaya? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> and um, and I knew this. You know, It wasn't like I was like, oh, I can do this. And their cuisine is easy. I knew it would be difficult. I was actually starting to take classes from a buddy of mine. His name is Yuji. Um, and it was just hard. And I wasn't, and I wasn't. I'm passionate about them, but I wasn't as passionate about cooking it. I could feel it, that it wasn't what, and I'm glad, you know, my partner's like, why aren't we doing barbecue? And I had never thought about it. And I'm like, I, let me give me two weeks, do some research. And I thought about it and I'm like, yeah, I'm in, let's do it. And that's how I get here. Yeah. So you've, so, you know, you, you got interested in barbecue, you're, you're into it. And since then you've been recognized on multiple occasions for your prowess. You've won multiple competitions. What is it that's so unique or special about your barbecue? Well, barbecue, I think, is about passion. Um, it's, it's, you know, nobody cooks a brisket for themselves, right? And so it's it's kind of the thought that barbecue is the friendliest food out there. Um, you know, it's the food of uh, celebrations, family gatherings, graduations, weddings. Uh, so we, you know, I just, I think, we, you know, we have, if you ask me how we do it, it's, it's our team. It's the most important thing about it is our team. Um, we have an amazing, you know, group of people that, that I work with, I get to work with, and um, everybody's really passionate. So we really try to show that craft and passion. You know, we're kind of a goofy barbecue restaurant that um, we have New England's largest American whiskey list, which is pretty cool. Uh, over 400 labels. Um, really strong team, as I mentioned. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's good recipes and a lot of research. I, mean, I did lots and lots of research and, and you know, so... There's a little bit of everything. You know? Sure. Are there are there kind of different instincts that you have to have when it comes to wood fired cooking than you would maybe in a regular kitchen? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, what's yeah, uh, wood fire cooking, wood fire cookery, which to me is the best type of cookery. Um, I mean, you know, when I was a young grill cook learning to work grills, uh, live fire grills, I had I had been a grill chef always. That's kind of where I got put into. And so working like Montague's and these were like um, gas fired, like broilers and grills, all good, but they're consistent. Generally, you kind of have some hot spots, but with fire, what you learn is that you, what I, this is my favorite part. When it's at its best, it's at its worst. Meaning when it's at its best, it's at its apex and it's about to jump down. So now you need to build it hotter. Though so your instinct is not to make a fire hotter because you're working over it, but you need to, you will train yourself to learn that. Or the rotisserie chickens, when they used to be, when they were ready, they would drop their fat. And then you they would drop in your arms and, and burn your arms. And you learn to love that because you knew that was the chicken was ready. Um, so, yeah, you get these instincts that you you know and you you, you learn. Um, and such better flavor. It's so great. I wish everybody would do wood and charcoal. To me, it's, it's the coolest way to cook. Do you have any, uh, I, I don't know, stories or kind of learning experiences you had while working with fire? I mean, I've got so many burn stories that it would put you to sleep, but um, <laughs> um, no, you know, just classic stuff. I remember talking to, um, talking to, I was standing on my patio, my, uh, my Tremont 647, which was my, my, my first love of restaurants that I opened. And uh, I was talking to some, 
some guests that's on the patio and I, out of the corner of my eye, see like a flare and I'm like, hmm, I need to go. And I ran back there and the whole kitchen erupted in flames. It was the most craziest thing ever. But what was cool about it is we had trained for it. Um, so like our team knew exactly what to do, how to handle it, how to put it out and how to clean it up very quickly. So we, we had, you know, I just thought that was neat that the, like, the, they didn't really need me to run back there. They knew exactly what to do. And, um, I always love, there's a chef who once said, um, you know, chefs yell when they haven't prepared their teams for what's to come. And, uh, and I think coaches too, right? But if, if you've prepared your team, they know exactly what the play is and they will be successful. So it was super cool to see that, that action happen. Great, great. Hey, yeah. I, I hear you're looking to kind of, you have a movie in mind about your barbecue journey. You're looking to have uh, something like that produced. Can you kind of <laughs> give us uh, an idea of some elements of that? Yeah. It's not. I mean, I got, I got, I got a script. I mean, it's not a script, but I, I got. I'm pretty good at. Um, think of Miracle on Ice. You remember that movie? Oh yeah. Mir- so that's when the where the Americans beat the Russians. Miracle on Ice meets Moneyball meets Swingers, and basically, uh, it's about Chris Hart and I, who's Chris Hart's our team leader on the barbecue team, and how we went about building a team. And winning, doing something that everybody said was impossible. And that was uh, becoming the first, not, or not even becoming, just winning the world championships of barbecue, which, you know, nobody, everybody says there's no way a New England team could do this. And we did it. It's very interesting how we did it. Primarily, you, the way you win a sport is by practice. So practice, practice, practice. So lots of practice. Chris will tell you a story that, you know, he cooked so much barbecue that his neighbor's dog would need it. Um, you know, because it's just you just have so much barbecue, good practice. But the other way is we did it through um, technology. Um, we did a lot of um, logarithms and figured out stuff. We did it through science. We did a lot of molecular cooking. Uh, used stuff called like meat glue and all different uh, sulfates, nitrates, MSG, all this stuff, which is all legal and everybody uses it. Um, and we built an incredible team, which is kind of the swingers part of a group of, you know, six friends who love each other and love to drive each other crazy. And it's a wild experience of highs and lows and fistfights and, and marriages and divorces and, 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 and just all sorts of things that happen for, to this team to eventually, you know, drive down 18 hours and um, win the world championships of barbecue. You know, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, so, very cool. Uh, one of the uh, if I could just tell you one quick story. One time we so we went to the world championships nine times. You have to qualify nine times before we win the world championships, right? Maybe it's eight times. I can't remember. Um, I think it was like the first time we were there, and these young ladies came over and just started talking to us. And this was they were like, "Oh, you're from the north," blah blah blah. And then they started giving us lots of drinks. And we're like, "Yeah, this is great. We're hanging out with them." Uh, come to find out they were from our competitors team and they were there to get us super drunk, which we absolutely fell for and came in very close to last the first year we were there. Just a <laughs> couple of, you know, ah, Northern knuckleheads didn't know, you know, and they're like, yeah, you know, fool us once though. Only fool us once. Well, those are some, those are some interesting tactics. Those competitions are serious, huh? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's prestige and money. Absolutely. Um, so when you've kind of been been acclaimed for for this kind of your food and you're kind of regarded as an expert in barbecue, what do you find still exhilarating about you know running a restaurant? What do I what don't I find exhilarating? Um, you know, so I'm in this new chapter of my life where I have multiple units. So I'm a well, I'm a single unit guy. That's all I've ever worked in all my life. That's what I trained for. So to make this jump to multi-unit was really um, crazy. I really didn't feel comfortable. I'm going to say for about two years. Uh, I met with a lot of people in my area. Um, uh, you know, Joanne Chang from Flower Bakery, Steve DeFlippo from Davios. These guys have, you know, multiple units and very successful. And I, I met with so many people just trying to find out what was important to them and what they do and what does their day look like? Because I had no idea. Like, I wasn't even really allowed to be in the kitchen anymore. You know, like, they're like, and I couldn't be, you know what they call chefs, passionate? Uh, I couldn't be passionate, right? Because I have all these units and people don't know who I am and they don't know my expectations. So uh, I had to learn a better way to communicate. So for me personally, I just love learning more. And like, I feel like I got my master's with my last restaurant and now I'm getting my PhD and I love learning. Secondly, 
you know, we have this woman, her name is Amy Magner. She's our VP of ops. And working with her has really been an eye opener. What she does and how she builds teams is just phenomenal. And how she zeroes in and gets to the kind of the core of what needs to be done. I'm just, you know, tickled by how about the teams. So I don't know. I just love every day, you know. I, I, I want to tell you one. I want to tell you one thing that I do that I'm going to bet that most, probably 99% of your listeners don't do. This is the one thing I do every Monday morning. I respond to every Google and every uh, Resi. We use Resi uh, review. Every single one. We have thousands, and I've responded probably to 98% of them. Uh, for a while, my buddy did it because I, I was busy. Uh, well, oh, I was opening a restaurant, so another guy and one of my managers did it. But um, I, I, every single one. And this is kind of something that I find really important. And I love to, my, my favorite challenge is trying to win customers back. I love to try to get them to come back. That's my favorite. Why do you find, why do you consider that to be so important? Well, studies show that if you get them to come back, that, um, that they'll become super fans generally. But that's not why I do it. I, and, and a lot of times they're like, oh, we'll take down a review. I'm like, I don't even want you to take down a review. It's not why I'm doing this. Uh, I do it because I really believe in our, our, our product. I really believe in our teams. Um, I love our teams and I love what we do. And, I, and I, it's kind of like, you know, when you a band that you love and you're like, I don't understand how everybody just doesn't love this band. And so for me, that's really what I, what I want is to show people like, yeah, all right, we are out of tune for that moment, but we are back in tune. We are jamming strong. Come check this out. So how did your, your restaurant, which now has multiple locations, but how did, how did yes. the smoke shop come about? Well, I mean, as I mentioned, I'm partnered with a guy and, and I've known him for years. We, you know, we had mutual admiration for each other. And uh, he's what's really great is, you know, he frees me up to do whatever I want to do. What I want to do is marketing and not in this order. I, I shouldn't say that, but in, I like marketing, um, food and, and hospitality. That's what I love. That's all I want to do. And when I had my small restaurant, I did everything, as you can imagine, chief bottle washer to HR to uh, you know, check writer to the other stuff that I mentioned, and I and I'm good at I'm really good at some stuff. I really am, but I'm really bad at some other stuff. And you know, uh, and what's great is we we had a slight lease thing happening, and I you know the 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 landlord emailed us, and my my partner's like just quickly off the top of his head like no, that's not what the lease says. The lease says this 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 and this. And he just takes care of that stuff. And to me, that frees me up not to worry. I implicitly trust him. He's got it going on. You know, he takes care of the, the HR, the office. Well, I play a part in the HR, but he takes care of the office, the payroll, the, the, the insurance, the, all that stuff that I didn't want to deal with. So, for, so, so it's been great because that's how it helps us grow. You know, we both have focuses. We focus on separate things and do our, get a job, job done. For those not in the Northeast or who might be going to the Northeast, what can a customer expect when going there? The smoke shop? Yeah. Well, I didn't know if you meant going to New England. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> you get a bunch of rabid Celtics fans these days. <laughs> um, we'll see what this airs. Maybe not. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you're going to walk into a, a light, sweet smoke smell, um, kind of a raucous room, not too loud, but definitely a little bit of excitement going on. Um, we have towel walls with towels are painted on them. And uh, you'll see, uh, you'll no matter where you are, you'll see our large bourbon, um, bourbon menu. It's really great, friendly, not over the top service. Uh, I would encourage you to get our wings. These are phenomenal. They're gonna, they're mind blowing. They're not like your standard buffalo wings. They're just amazing. Um, you know, our sides are always changing and really good. Get the cucumber salad if that's on the menu, or two potato salad. It's all good. Um, but I, what's funny is we get a lot of like, wow, we can't believe great barbecue in New England, and yeah. uh, that's a, a a nice compliment. But I would point out that great barbecue could be done anywhere. There is no. Uh, copyright on it from the south or anything like that just like great japanese is found wherever you are and great italian can be found where you are no reason great barbecue can't be here hey uh, uh tell me about your cookbook pitmaster recipes techniques and barbecue wisdom what would somebody who buys that be getting obviously they'd be getting the, they, well they'd be getting the best barbecue book out there i mean i'll put that book against anybody's um it's an it's an amazing amazing cookbook 
Um, you know, it has kind of our, our journey in there, but really it's about about um, a bunch of different pit, pit masters from around the country talking about their region or their style. Um, Bill Durney from hometown in New York, uh, G- Sam Jones from North Carolina, really cool stuff. So little vignettes, little stories, plus just great regional recipes from American barbecue around, around the country. Um, and it's a little bit of competition stuff, but not much. Uh, pictures done by uh, Kenneth Goodman Photography. If, if you haven't looked at his website, you should. If you need food pictures, he's the guy you need. Um, it's just a really, I mean, it's a solid book. It's sold 70,000, 75,000 copies so far, uh, which is good. You know, it's, it's a good, good, solid sell. So uh, we're very proud of it. Very proud. Very nice. Hey, you also drive awareness for Share Our Strength, and you're involved with your community in many uh, ways. Tell me about some of those things that you're doing. Yeah. So, um, you know, my, my mentor, he really put into me about being good with your neighbor. And he didn't mean that just your next door neighbor, but that was important to him too. But it was being a part of the community. I also had a, a professor, his name was Dick Brush. Actually, his, I know it's a funny name, but that's his name uh, in college. And he pulled me aside and, and, and he's like, I could tell you're really smart. You're going to ace this class. He goes, but you got to get involved. Because I would just sit back in the corner and be quiet. I didn't really, I don't know. I had my own agenda. Um, and, you know, so between kind of that and then another guy, his name was Guy Abelson. Unfortunately, he passed. He was a, my boss at a place called The Improv. That's I-N, that I-N. I am as Nancy Prov in Providence. Um, and he was involved with Share Our Strength and he got me involved with them and, uh, you know, just doing events and stuff like that. And then when I uh, started working on my own, I got heavily involved with, no, with Share Our Strength, which sort of rebranded into No Kid Hungry. So I'll use those terms um, in and out, but No Kid Hungry, you know, um, I believe it is now one in four children are at risk of hunger in the United States, which is crazy. Before the pandemic, it was one in five. Um, You know, I used to be one of those children that got that uh, cheap school lunch. And I I remember having in the 70s funny money. I grew up with a single mom, um, federally assisted single mom. Uh, now I can eat whatever I want and eat all the shrimp I want. So, you know, I, I think it's really my duty as a ho- person in hospitality to give back and be involved with the community. And since food is my kind of love and forte, I think aligning with um, hunger charities, it was a kind of a, a, a no brainer for me. Um, so definitely check out nokidhungry.org, uh, strength.org. I, I, you'll see what a great um, organization they are. Um, they created this cool thing called breakfast after the bell and started in Colorado. But basically, if you remember, if you went to public school, you'll probably remember there were a couple kids eating breakfast in the school lunch in the, in the cafeteria in the morning. Not many though, probably maybe five, 10. So what it is, that's a federally assisted program. And the problem was, is it was a stigmatic and it was early. So kids, a lot of kids couldn't get there because they took the bus. The bus didn't get there early enough, right? So even though there was this free breakfast, kids weren't taking it. Something like 10 or 20% of people were taking advantage of t- those, uh, uh, those uh, eligible. 10 or 20% were taking advantage. Of. No Kid Hangry came up with this idea. Let's do it after the bell. First period. They had to, get, they had to work with the janitors' unions. They had to work with the teachers' unions. And they got it passed. And what magically happened after feeding all children after the bell? Attendance went up. Disciplinary went down. Test scores went up. So just by feeding children breakfast. How cool is that? And I think everybody, like, I think there's a lot of, like, finger pointing and maybe that person screwed their life up so they don't get anything or whatever people think. I don't really care. I think we all can agree that children should be fed. Let's give them a chance to screw it up. You know what I mean? Sure. And hopefully not. Right. So, so how cool is that? I mean, that's why I, I'm really involved with it. Rodman, uh, Rodman celebration. I'm, 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 I'm a board member of that. That's really cool. Um, they do all sorts of children's uh, charities and stuff. And, um, I'm a sucker for kids. I got four-year-old twin girls, and uh, it will, I'm, I'm just a sucker. So. Great. What was that website you referenced again? Strength.org. Okay. 
Hey, uh, how can p- people find out more about the smoke shop and everything else you have going on? The smoke shop barbecue.com and husbands.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Andy husbands. You can follow the smoke shop on Instagram. Um, yeah, that's the best way, you know, Twitter, maybe if, if I feel like it. Last question for you. Uh, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times. If you were to go to the smoke shop, what would be kind of as a customer, what would be kind of your like go to item? I think everybody wants the wings, wings and butter cake. If you haven't had our butter cake, otherwise known as uh, St. Louis ooey gooey cake, um, it's it's amazing. But the wings are probably and probably a glass of Angel Angel's Envy on the rocks, or uh, perhaps Whistle Pig on the rocks. That that's good for me. Um, but I'll tell you something. I've been grooving on. We have the ultimate fried fish sandwich. And I designed it after a uh, fish witch or whatever McDonald's calls their mm-hmm. freaking fish fish sandwich. I designed it after that, just a lot better. And uh, I've been eating that now and then. I, I, I try not to eat too much there. It's it's so good. I can't like it's it's a little overwhelming. Yeah, it sounds good. And your your website will get you hungry right away too. Hey, uh, yeah, Andy, no, is, go ahead. It's been great to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate your stories. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. If you ever need anything, reach out. You know how to get me. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. This has been great. I appreciate it. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast. podcast.